about 2010, Harry Reid, who was the Senate Majority Leader, used what became known at the time as the nuclear option, which was to do away with the filibuster when it came to judicial appointments. Okay, you guys remember the filibuster? I kind of explained it, but you need 60 votes out of 100 to pass them. Okay, because if you only have 59, the other 41 can prevent it from being voted on. Okay, the nuclear option says this. You only need 51 votes to confirm judicial appointments. Which means what goes around comes around. So how many Supreme Court justices did Trump get to choose? Three. Mm -hmm. And the Democrats couldn't stop it. You might remember, I don't know if you're old enough to remember, when Justice Kavanaugh went through his Senate confirmation and they went back to high school and accused him of things he did in high school. This man had a 30 plus year career spanning with impeccable recommendations from people that worked with him and so forth. But they went back to high school parties and went after it. Okay. He got confirmed. All right. This is called borking somebody. And you know who used to sit on the Senate Judiciary Committee for decades? Joe Biden. Okay. So he was one of the senators questioning these, these judicial nominees. Okay. Now, the midterms are coming up in November. Yes? This is likely to change. Yes? So, word on the street is that they're pushing Breyer out. They want him to retire. Because if he dies, because he's old, if he dies after Republicans take control of the Senate, then, you know, and then if, if he holds on a little bit longer and you get a Republican president in 2024 and then he dies, that's even worse. Follow me? Okay. Now, did anybody hear? Biden is not going to do a nationwide search for the most qualified person to be on the most important court in the land. No, he set parameters on that. He's only going to choose what? Same parameters he used for vice president. A female. Of a minority. African American woman. That's it. That's what he said. I'm gonna I'm gonna appoint an African American woman. Okay, it doesn't matter. It's the most qualified person. Now, you guys know the difference between strict construction and loose construction. Okay, Breyer is on the left. Okay, so Breyer wants to be replaced by somebody on the left. Okay. Strict constructionists are on the right. So when we look at the Constitution, guys, it's a very small document. It's a very short document. This is the U.S. Constitution. That's it. You can fit it on one piece of paper. A small handwriting. Okay. It's written in a broad manner. You with me? Now, there are specifics in that. But there's a lot of gaps to fill in between. Strict constructionists try and figure out exactly what the founders meant by what they wrote in the Constitution and stay with that. Loose constructionists believe in what's called a living, breathing Constitution that adapts to changes in society. Follow me? So let me give you a simple example. When it came to the mask mandate, does the executive branch of government have the power, the authority within the Constitution to mandate that every business in this country affecting 80 million American workers, that they have to get a vaccine to go to work or be tested weekly? 
Does the President of the United States have this authority, especially when there's been no law passed? Now, if there was a law passed by Congress that you had to do this, the President should be able to enforce it. That's how the Constitution works. But can the executive branch just come up with this rule and put it on 80 million people? When you have the justices asking the lawyers questions about this issue, Sonia Sotomayor, who is a loose constructionist, was worried that we had to do this. This was the right thing to do. But that was not the question before the court. The question before the court was, does the executive branch have the power to do this within the Constitution? Are you following me? She's worried about, is it the right thing to do? Making everybody get vaccinated. That's not the question. This is a question of the constitutional powers given to government. You following me? One is based on feelings. And one is based on law. She's not even asking the right questions. Because she doesn't care. She's a loose construction. These people care about the exact words and text used. And when you can't figure out what they meant by those words, as we're going to learn later this week and next week, strict constructionists read these. You've all heard of the Federalist Papers? These Federalist Papers explain the Constitution. They're written by Madison, who's called the father of the Constitution, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay, who was the first Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. They explained the Constitution. You want to know what impeachment means? You want to know what high crimes and misdemeanor means? Guys, there's an index in here. And on like eight different pages, there's references to impeachment. That you can go find out what they meant by that. The other thing you can do is read Madison's notes. Because Madison took notes during the Constitutional Convention when they were writing the thing. So you can read his notes. That's what strict constructions do. They go with the original intent of the authors. Follow me? Now, it's obvious Joe Biden's going to pick a loose construction. No big deal. That's, that's how our system works. Elections have consequences. We elected a Democratic president. We have a Democrat-controlled Senate because of the vice president. This is how it works. They got rid of the filibuster. This is how it works. Okay? I looked up a list of federal judges that were African American and women. What's really kind of cool is uh, you go back and look, because I taught you guys this in history. The first black federal judge was appointed by Harry Truman, 1948, okay? There's only been two African-Americans on the Supreme Court, Thurgood Marshall, and one sitting now, Clarence Thomas, who is a strict constructionist. Probably the, the African-American on the court is the most conservative on the court, okay? And that's why Democrats love to hate him, because he's black. He's also Catholic. Clarence Thomas. Read about that guy. You want to read a book? Read about Clarence Thomas. Okay? He's he's a pretty impressive guy. But they tried to bork him. Accused him of sexual harassment. His hearings in the Senate were awful. And Joe Biden treated Clarence Thomas awful in those hearings. You can go back and watch. There's video of it. Okay? Judge Bork was appointed by Reagan did not get confirmed by the Senate. They shut him down. Okay. They said he was too radical. I think I got his book over here somewhere. I used to anyways. Okay, so Stephen Breyer, his term on the court is coming to an end. Okay. We'll see who the president picks. But by shrinking it to an African-American female, he really limits the number of people because they usually choose federal judges. 
to fill those seats. Okay? So, hey, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that hiring somebody based solely on their race as the most important factor is unconstitutional. Would you say that what they're doing now is too unconstitutional? It's not, but it's it's ironic or humorous that Biden says I'm only going to choose a black woman when the Supreme Court that she would sit on has said you cannot hire people based solely on that. <laughs> I think that's you know it's hypocritical. I don't know. Ironic, funny. Sad, all at the same time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's taking it to the, the top court in the nation and the vice presidency. Is Kamala Harris the, Kamala Harris the best vice president we could have chosen? No. Absolutely not. Okay, now listen, I don't, nothing against her. And it has nothing to do with the fact that she's a woman, okay? It has nothing to do with her race. Because she's half Indian and half Haitian. Or Jamaican. She's half Jamaican and half Indian, from India. Okay, she identifies as an African American. Okay. Is she the descendant of slaves? No, no, no. In fact, in Jamaica, it is believed that her family owns slaves. And like black owned black slaves? Or yes. Well, because everybody in Jamaica is black. That would hurt if that ever got any attention. Well, you can look it up. You can look it up. It came out during the campaign. Okay, now listen. Again, nothing against her, okay? But have you heard her talk? Have you heard her speak on, on like, guys? Listen, listen. Whether you like Biden or not, if you don't like Biden, Harris is more radical than Biden is. You understand? Like, she was polling at 1%. She ran for president. She was polling at 1% in the Democratic primary. She dropped out early. And I don't, do any of you guys know Tulsi Gabbard? Oh, yeah. This woman is awesome. She's a Democrat from Hawaii. Okay, and she called, during the debate, she called out Kamala Harris, and Kamala Harris did not know what to do. Okay, because Kamala Harris was a prosecutor in California. She was the DA in Los Angeles. Okay, and she, you know what she did? She put a lot of black men behind bars for long sentences for drug offenses, okay? I mean, so she was doing what they were accusing me of, like Trump of being and this sort of stuff. She was doing it. She was, you know. And then Tulsi Gabbard brought up this guy that would that would have been convicted and new evidence came forward, it, came forward and she suppressed it. She called her out on it, okay? I like this Tulsi Gabbard, you know. I'd vote for her. Wasn't it um, Kamala Harris who was the DA when that one group did the sting operation in Planned Parenthood and they like basically had staffers who were either men or just not pregnant, you know, be on the pregnancy test and eventually they exposed Planned Parenthood for essentially selling abortions to women who didn't need it. And didn't she put the investigative journalist behind bars? Uh, Grace, I'm not particular about that specific case, but... You may have heard that. Yeah, I don't know. Um, okay, so good. Um, we'll be keeping an eye on this. All right. So it's, just, yeah, it's government class. I'm like, dude, I have I have to take some time to talk about this. Right? Okay. Just so you guys know what's going on when you hear things in the news and and so forth. Okay. So it'll be pretty interesting uh, how this all plays out. Oh, <laughs> real quick, rumor mill. Kamala resigns as vice president. Biden picks her to be on the Supreme Court. He replaces her uh, and gets a new vice president. 
How would you give a new that, That's a rumor coming? mill going on. Now, well, how would you replace your new vice president in the middle of a term? The, 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 I, I don't know. Uh, or do you just have Nancy uh, Pelosi do that? Hey, look, that could end up working out for us. Because if something happens to Biden, Paul Harris is president of the United States. There's a... Uh, can you just remove the vice president? You can impeach a vice president. They can resign. You can re impeach them for high crimes and misdemeanors. So she could just resign as what happened? Yeah, she would resign her spot. Now, not until she was confirmed. <laughs> yeah. You'd need 51 votes. And she used to be in the Senate, too. She was in the Senate for one term. Okay. So um, she's got a lot of friends there. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out, okay? And I know that's a lot of judicial branch, and we're just starting this class. So, okay. Um, yeah, we'll keep an eye on. Okay, hopefully, you guys, uh, I did, I graded a bunch of your assignments uh, this morning. Uh, the John Locke questions, the ones, those of you that did it, really good. Uh, your answers, um, uh, I can tell you tried to figure it out. Uh, Shauna. You used uh, the last two words of your assignment. What was it? I was, I was just going to ask where you got that. <clears throat> oh, it's like something flattery. Corrupt, corrupt flattery or something like that. I don't know. I did have some words. That's okay. No, I just wanted to know you. I just kind of looked up. Right. It, yeah. Probably the difficult one. So uh, the bill, the ability to appeal, is so important because without it, it is a denial of liberty and promotes corrupted flattery. So, I think I asked in the last like, in the last Listen, it's corrupted flattery. This is what that means. You are a business in the United States today, okay? You guys know what Build Back Better is? Build Back Better is Biden's program, the, the, the human infrastructure bill, okay? Yesterday, Biden had uh, CEOs of major corporations at the White House that supported Build Back Better, okay? So in order to get what you want as a business, you want the right regulations, you want that are going to protect your business interests and so forth, right? So you've got to go to Washington, D.C., flatter the government, oftentimes with campaign donations. You follow me? Flatter them. This is called, called crony capitalism, where you get these people in there in power in Washington, D.C., that make all the rules. So all the corporations have got to go to D.C., and beg those people to produce rules that will help them. Corrupt flattery. Love it. Never heard that term before, but I'm going to use it. Okay. But the more common term is like crony capitalism. Okay. The real power in this country used to be in New York, in New York Stock Exchange, stock market. Today, the real power in this country is here. They make all the rules, regulations. That hand of government that Adam Smith talked about, uh-huh, it's like wrapped around your neck. Okay, two hands. <laughs> okay. Oh, All right, let's talk social contract. Hey, Emma, I saw you tried to turn in the assignment. It was oh, blank. It came up blank. Okay. So if you could just take a picture of it and send me an email or on, on inbox, I'll be able to get it in. And then, like... <clears throat> Gong, I got yours. It was, it was late, but I approved that. Okay, it just had to be done by class today. I got a couple more in there to do, so. Good? All right. But no, seriously, good job with those, those of you that did it. Okay. Um, all right, so let's talk about Thomas Hobbes. Okay. Now, you had three different um, philosophers here, okay? And it looks like, just based on time, this will extend into tomorrow. But, um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll record for sure, okay, um, okay, 
This is the most famous quote from Thomas Hobbes, right? Life in a state of nature would be nasty, brutish, and short. In all of these, you see this term, a state of nature or natural law. Yes? Did anybody summarize what, what, what is meant by this idea of natural law or a state of nature? When they're what? When you're born, okay, yes, in a sense, you will be born into a state of nature, of some nature, yeah. Okay, so, um, well, that would be describing different states of nature just based on your philosophy. So some people believe in objective, some believe in subjective, right? So a state of nature in general, well, I mean, what is that? Okay, I want you to think about it like this, okay? The jungle, right? Who do we call the king of the jungle? The lion, right? So, it, it, even though lions live in a safari somewhere, right? It's, yeah. But anyhow, a tiger would be more apt, right? Now, um, so in a jungle, in a state of nature, it's dog eat dog, right? It's like, Survival of the fittest. Yes? If there's no law in a state of nature, there's no civil society or political society, it's every man for himself. Yes? So in a perfect state of nature, this is what we're looking at. Man living without law together. What does that look like? Well, for Thomas Hobbes, in a perfect state of nature, it's nasty, brutish, and short. You understand? Life is awful in a state of nature. So, he proposes a social contract of sorts to rein that in, to rein people in, yes? So would you say Hobbes has a pessimistic view of humankind or or an optimistic view of humankind. Yeah. We're not good. Okay. We're not good. Now, his most famous work is called a book called The Leviathan. Okay. They talk about that. Now, have you heard that term before, Leviathan? Where is that term found? In the Bible, what is it? What is the Leviathan in the Bible? Yeah, yeah, it's like the sea monster, right? That consumes everything. Okay, the Leviathan, guys, in in political science terms, is the government. And a very strong government is a Leviathan. Yes, one that is all consuming, controlling. Okay. And this is what Hobbes presents to us, is that what that's what we need. We need a Leviathan to control our combat, combative, destructive way. How does he describe man? Ah. Mm -hmm. Selfish. Are we selfish? So he's right. How else does he describe? Rational with an E, right? Subjective. Subjective. Sub. Okay. Now, just so you know, uh, guys, you're going to be writing about, you're going to do a compare and contrast of Hobbes and Locke on the test. Okay. Now, selfish, rational, subjective. Okay, so we know how to think. We're rational, right? And we got to look out for our own self-interest. We're rational. So this Leviathan is a rational choice to form a government that is all-powerful. 
an absolute ruler, right? Now, where, where does Hobbes get himself in trouble with the crown? Because all of these men are writing this during the divine right of kings. Why is he afraid to publish this? Even though he's advocating for a monarchy. Because the divine right. Because he doesn't, he doesn't recognize it as a divine right. He recognizes we just need a strong dictator. We'll go ahead and call him a monarch. But it's not a divine right. And that's where he, you know, he's kind of crossing the line. And that's why, I mean, he flees the country, right? He goes, he goes, uh, does he go to France? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So, um, now let's get into this. Could you please send Anna Soyton and Grace Schuster to the office and Karen Lee? Uh, okay. They're going to send Father Lee. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you tell him I'm about to talk about subjective and objective truth, so you need to come back. <laughs> the wrong one. Every time. All the time. The wrong. Do you know this person? Yeah. Are you guys friends? Well, not really. <laughs> Her locker is next to mine, obviously. Oh, you're the same class? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that can be confusing. They don't seem to realize they get this call as my community. Gotcha. <laughs> Just She's Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about this. Objective truth. I know you guys have studied this. Yes. What does subjectivism mean? There is no absolute truth. Okay. There's what is truth on our subjective truth? Whatever you want it to be. Whatever feels good. What are you drinking, Ann? I'm going to fix that. I'm thirsty. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and finish that. This, uh, that's all right. Oh, too bad. It makes me feel good, Anna. And I want it. So it's right. Yes? That's subjective truth. Today we use a term called what? Relativism. Moral relativism. Yes? Okay, good. So you guys have a handle on that. Okay. And so understand this. This this is kind of the big part here. So there the good and evil are not concrete. They're not concrete, right? Everybody has their own good and evil. Okay. Would this project that Hobbes believed in God? No. He's probably an atheist. Okay. So because of this subjective truth that man has, you do need a strong government. Because what I just did was, you know, if I stole that cup and took that from you, I'm actually breaking the law. Okay. But because it feels good to me, in a, in a state of nature, I can do whatever the hell I want. Include killing you. Or raping you. You understand? I mean, I, I can do whatever I want. Okay? And, and so, and when people do whatever they want, you live in that society. You better have strong government. Or you're going to have chaos on you. So, 
Understand this. This is a social contract because it's a rational choice to choose that, to protect ourselves from each other. You with me? Okay. Hot. All right, then we go to John Locke, who lived from 1632 to 1704. The quote at the top is very important. The law of nature given to us by God commands that we do not harm to others in regard to their life, health, liberty, or possession. We all have the right to life, liberty, and property. Now, he's writing this in 1660, okay, is that right? Uh, okay, yeah, uh, he didn't, he wrote it in about 1680, doesn't publish it until 1690, for fear, because he is committing what? Treason. Okay, he is denying the divine right of kings. Okay, now both of these men are English. Okay, and by this time, we, uh, the English, live under the Anglican Church. The Protestant Reformation has taken place. Okay, so the Anglican Church rather than the Catholic Church. Okay. So Locke, you would consider a Protestant, okay? Now, the state of nature, he talks about natural law, okay? And I think one of the most important parts of this is, if you jump down about halfway through the second paragraph, he says that the state of nature is pre-political, but not pre-moral. So when nature was created, it was given what? Truth. It was given God's law. It was given truth. Okay? So objective truth I don't know if I've ever done this with you guys. If you were to give me a definition of what truth is what is truth? Now you can give me the dictionary definition. Does anybody know the, remember it? Okay, so what we can see and what we can rationalize, basically, right? What is that we can see and rationalize is true. I'm sorry? It sounds very much like misbehaving. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, we're in a Catholic school. All right, I'm talking about Protestants here. All right, my wife and I did this really cool video study called um, the Truth Project. Okay, it was, it was really uh, enlightening for me. Um, but for for many of us, and this may include you as well. Um, Certain my opinion of what truth is. God is truth. God's law is truth. The state of nature that God gave us is truth. Okay? And we, you know, we have limited capacity to understand that truth. But truth gives you a definitive good and evil. Yes? So, guys, I like to read. 
And generally, I read like spy novels and stuff like that. You know, like CIA stuff. Entertain. So I had finished all the books I had that I was reading, and my wife reads a lot. And she reads a lot about religion. Okay. And so I'm just going through her stack of books, just looking for something to read. And I see this book in there. It's called Mere Christianity. You heard of this? C.S. Lewis, right? Have you read, have any of you guys read any of this? Okay, it's not real long. Okay, it's, it's a pretty short book. I start reading this, and some of it's like, it was just doing this right over my head, okay? But actually, Mere Christianity is taken from a series of lectures that C.S. Lewis did on the radio around the time of World War II, okay? And um, he's talking about how do, you, how do you convince an atheist that there's God? You got any friends that are atheists? Yeah. So how do you how do you convince them there's a God? C.S. Lewis gives this example. What you do to your friend, Sean, is you say something really nasty to them. I mean, like hurt their feelings type of thing. Okay? Now the fact that it hurt their feelings and they feel like what you just said was wrong. Okay? They said, well, that wasn't nice. That was wrong. You shouldn't have done that. Well, ask the simple question. Why was it wrong? Because if we're subjective, and it makes you feel good to say it, Shauna, then it's right. But if it, and you guys know, when you hurt somebody's feelings on purpose, it's wrong. You know that, right? How do you know that? How do you know when you do something wrong? Well, you have a conscience. Now, if we're doing an autopsy on the brain or the whole human body, can you guys tell me where that conscience is? Can you, like, dissect that out of the human body? Where did we get the conscience? From God. Now, do animals have conscience? Okay, you've seen the videos, right, of people like when uh, they come home from work and their dog is like chewed up all this crap, you know, and it's like the whole house is a mess. And they look at the dog and the dog's over there cowering like they know they're guilty. You know what I mean? Is that a conscience of a dog, or is that learned behavior? So I think, I mean, that's a very simplistic example, uh, but I mean, there's a lot more evidence of God uh, than that, but when we just talk about objective truth here, uh, knowing when something's wrong, something is good and something is evil. Now, what about us as human beings? Are we born Good, or are we born evil? Okay, so we are born good, but we have sin stamped on us, yes? Thank you, Cain. <laughs> Thank you, Adam and Eve, right? Okay, so... Yeah, I mean, we, we are born good with the capacity to do good, okay? And if we learn the difference between right and wrong, and we learn God's truth, then guess what? We can live free with each other. We can form a social contract that limits ourselves using God's truths to write laws that protect us from life. From one another. Now we don't use all of God's truths as laws. 
because we have a secular government. We learned that religious governments controlled theocracies can become quite dictatorial. You guys read the Scarlet Letter, okay? And the Salem Witch Trials. Okay, so if you get super religious governments, they tend to become quite oppressive. So you need a secular government that uses truth to write laws. Right? So, guys, adultery, we all know is wrong. But it's not against the law. Okay. Now, in a divorce proceeding, if you are the cheating partner, well, then that's not a no-fault divorce. That's a fault divorce. Okay? And that can affect how the divorce takes place under our laws. Okay? So, why? Or, excuse me. Yeah, why? All right. All right, so, he says, morality stems from natural law which is inherent in all people and prevents them from harming each other or harming others okay but even though we know right from wrong sometimes we we screw up okay so guys the impact of Locke's view uh, cannot be understated the bell about to ring okay i will pick up we'll do a little more lock tomorrow and then we'll hit rousseau